Come on, come on, come on. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going for all our campuses as we sync up together. Let's keep it going. Let's also keep it going for the people who are watching us online. Let's make some noise for them as well. And y'all know where this is going. Let's give it up for Jesus in this place. Come on, give it up for Jesus. We are entering into, we have entered into this uh, Easter season. When I was growing up, when we get around this time of the year, there were certain songs that we would begin to sing. Some of you may know them. You may know a song like, When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died that which was gain, I count but loss. Y'all supposed to sing now. And pour contempt on all my pride. Or maybe you know this. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Come on, all the old school saints, say something. The cross, the cross, it's the cross. We're on this journey as we get to opportunity to celebrate the resurrection, but we don't get to the resurrection without first coming to the cross. See, Jesus is the central figure of our faith, but the cross is the central reminder of how great his love is for us. See, the cross is actually a contradiction. It's a great contradiction. It's a symbol of death and life, of hate and love, of violence and peace, of accusation and forgiveness, of destruction and restoration, defeat and victory. The cross proves that the world is evil and that the plans of God are always good. The cross, the cross, once the cruelest form of execution, yet now it is a symbol of abundant life. The cross, we need the cross. The cross is not only essential to our faith, it is necessary for our salvation. Oh, we need the cross. We need the cross. The Bible is so much more. When, when you limit the gospel story to just the, the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, you are giving me the answer without explaining the problem. And it's hard to appreciate the answer if we don't know what the problem is. And the cross is an answer to a problem. The cross is actually a prophetic promise that Jesus gives, that God gives back in Genesis 3 and 15. You all know the story. Adam and Eve, they mess up. They mess up bad. They mess up real, real bad. God gives Adam and Eve a command. He says, you can have anything you want, just don't touch this one thing. Anything you want, just don't touch this one thing. God is not doing it because he wants to withhold goodness. He's doing it because one of the greatest gifts that God will ever give you is choice. Yes. Will you choose to love me? Will you choose to obey me? But isn't it just like us that we can have everything and still want more? So the devil shows up in the form of a serpent and he has a conversation with Eve and, and he poses a question. Did God really say? Did he really say? The problem isn't the question. The problem is that he smuggled an assumption into the question. The assumption is maybe God doesn't want you to have the best stuff. Did God really say? Did God really say that you have to find your identity in him and not in your feelings or your culture? Did God really say that you have to love your enemies? Did, did he really say that? Well, guess what? Yeah, he did. He really said that. And when Satan shows up and asks the questions of, did God really say, he's actually saying, you now have the right to judge what God says. 
He's giving you the right to say, why don't you judge what God said? Maybe God is miserable and he's stingy and he wants to withhold goodness from you. So did God really say? So they listen and you know the story, they eat the fruit. And this is where sin begins. And I know we don't talk about it a lot in church, but we sin. This is where sin starts. If you don't know what sin is, simply sin is when you've convinced yourself that you know better than God. Sin. Sin is when you say, well, I don't think it's wrong. Y'all quiet because you've done it. Sin is whenever you look at what the Word of God is and you say, well, not for me, though. Here's the thing. You and I don't get to determine what sin is. God determines what sin is. Our responsibility is to follow it. Does that mean we're going to like it all the time? Nope. Does that mean we're going to agree all the time? Nope. I'm a parent. And I don't expect my child to understand everything that I'm doing for them. I don't expect them to. Because they can't see from my perspective in much the way that we can't see from God's. So when God say, don't touch the fire, he means don't touch the fire. Sin. Our problem, often our problem with sin is that we don't see sin as serious. But sin is Serious. Sin is so serious is that it separated us from God. Sin always brings shame and separation. When Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says in Genesis 2, it says they saw that they were naked, which means that they, now that they looked at themselves, they saw that the glory of God was removed. They couldn't see God's glory on themselves anymore. They, I, 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 now I'm ashamed. And in order to cover up their shame, they cut down some fig leaves to cover their bodies, but that wasn't enough. God does, the, he, he presents to us in this moment the substitute because whenever there's sin, someone has to pay for it. There must be death. So in Genesis 2, what we see God do is he actually kills the first animal and covers them with the skin. This was the substitution that God talks about in Genesis 3 and 15, because someone has to die. In Genesis 3, 15, he says this. This is God talking to the devil. He says, and I will put enmity or separation between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he, the he here is Jesus. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I don't know what y'all know about fighting, but the one who got their head crushed lost. <laughs> So right here, right in this moment, he's saying, here's what's going to happen. I, I have to create an answer before they even know there's a problem. And here's the answer. The answer is Jesus is going to crush the head of Satan, but there will be some bruises. He will strike your heel. There will be some hurt and some pain. And for the Christian, Jesus' death means that we don't have to die for our sins anymore. So this word that God gave in Genesis is the same thing that God follows all the way to the cross. In Jeremiah 1 and 12, God says, he says, I watch over my word to make sure that it's performed. God watches over his word to make sure that his word is performed. That means when they sinned in G Genesis and he gave the word in Genesis, he watched it in Genesis. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd King, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, the major prophets, the minor prophets, 12 generations. He watched his word from Genesis all the way way to the cross. And this gives me assurance. Here's why it gives me assurance. Because when God speaks a word in my life, I can be assured that he's going to watch over it to the end. He's going to watch over it. 
I, I want to tell somebody right now, if God has ever told you you're going to be delivered, guess what? You're going to be delivered. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. If he said you're going to be healed, guess what? You're going to be healed. If he said that your family is going to be restored, guess what? Your family is going to be restored. Why? Because God is careful to watch over his word. His word won't return back to him void. He watches his word. He watched as one tree got us in trouble and another tree will get us out. He watched. We were born with our backs to God and the cross changes our position from defiance to restoration. This is the cross. I think the problem that I have sometimes with how we present the cross is we make the cross too pretty. The cross is beautiful, but it's a bloody mess. In Luke 23, Jesus is sentenced to death in a popularity contest. It's between Jesus and Barabbas. And the people choose Barabbas. It's not even that they want Barabbas. They just don't want Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is a magnifying glass and a mirror, and he holds you accountable to your stuff. And we don't like that. I would rather choose the thief than to choose the Savior. So Jesus is accused, and he's sentenced to an execution, and and Jesus is being led to his execution. This is crucifixion. Crucifixion was a form of execution refined by the Romans to a precise art. It was carefully conceived to produce a slow death at maximum pain. After walking miles, after being sentenced, Matthew 27 says he was surrounded by the whole company of soldiers company of soldiers is somewhere between 12 and 200 men. And 12 and 200 men got together and they braided a crown of thorns. They braided a crown of thorns. And this is not from a rose bush. This is what, this comes from what's called a date palm. The thorns on the date palm are thick and they sometimes grow to 12 inches long. So they braided it. You know, that that means that there are some enemies in your life who will take time out to embarrass you. They braided it. And then they placed this crown of thorns on his head, not gently, but rough. And then came the beating. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a moment. Then came the beating where he was punched and slapped and kicked while he was blindfolded so he was unable to anticipate the blows. So he's bruised, he's swollen, he's dehydrated, and he's exhausted. Then came the flogging. And to be flogged, they stripped you naked and they tied your hands above your head. He was then whipped across his shoulders, his back, his legs, his thighs with a whip known as the flagellum or the cat of nine tails. And at the end of this whip, was bone and metal that was curved so that every time they hit him, it ripped away at his flesh. Every lash ripped away. Bits of bone and lead ripped Jesus' flesh to shreds. And this didn't go on for minutes. This went on for hours. This went on for hours. Isaiah 50 and 6, he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off my hair. Which means they actually grabbed his beard hair and they pulled it out of his face. Most 
Artists don't even come close in depicting what Jesus looked like after all this torture. He was probably the most inhuman looking thing you've ever seen. Isaiah 52, he says, they shall see the servant of God beaten and bloodied, an object of horror so disfigured many were astonished. His face and his whole appearance were marred more than any man's. One would scarcely know it was a person. For hours, they beat him. They mocked him. So he's beaten. He's bloody. He's disfigured. He's dehydrated. He's exhausted. He's at the point of collapse. And now he still must walk to his execution. And then they place on his back a crossbar. After they beat him long and hard, they place a crossbar on his back that is 75 to 125 pounds, and now he's forced to walk 2,000 feet, which is about one to three hours. Then he makes it to the point of execution, and he lays down, and it's not nails that they put in his wrists. It's six-inch long spikes that they put in each wrist and in each foot. The horror of this crucifixion began, and as he hung there, the elbows were intentionally bent and raised up above his head so to make it uncomfortable for him to breathe. And so he's beaten and he's bruised, he's dehydrated, he's exhausted, he's collapsed, and now he can barely exhale and inhale without pushing up on his feet, which have spikes in them just so he can breathe. And he does that as long as he can until he drops down and his full weight is on his wrist. And it's in this moment that Jesus says seven of the most powerful things we will ever hear. At this moment, while they are calling him names and spitting on him and saying that you're not the king, even though you call yourself the king of the Jews, Jesus looks down on them and says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. I don't know if I have that kind of Jesus in me. But he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus was Intercede at his execution, Jesus is interceding for his transgressors. It's a side effect of his nature. He's a God that forgives. I'm, I'm asking myself as I read this, why would he do it? It's because it's who he is. It's who he is because he could not both have your grace and hold the grudge. It's because it's who he is. It's what he does, 1 John 2 and 1. It's why he came, Romans 5 and 8. It's what we're waiting for, Isaiah 53 and 12. It's what he taught, Luke 6, 27. And it's the church's example to follow, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Jesus reveals that when you have been offended, forgiveness should be your goal. The crisis of cancel culture is that we throw away people that offend us, but Jesus encourages us and gives us an example and says, I want you to forgive even when it hurts you the most. I know it ain't easy, but Father, forgive them. Second half of that, he says, for they know not what they do. I struggled with this part. This was not an accidental execution. This was an intentional execution. Oh, they know what they're doing. They braided a crown of thorns. Oh, you know. You ripped his clothes off and you left him naked and you made him walk. Oh, they know what they're doing. But upon deeper study, what I discover is what Jesus is saying is they don't even realize who I am. There are some people that are going to come into your life and they're going to offend you because they don't realize who you are. They haven't gotten the full picture yet. If you knew who I was, you'd act different around me. Jesus said, they, they don't know yet. Yeah, you haven't revealed it to them yet. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. I even took the, just the liberty of even looking at it this way. He says, Father, forgive them. 
Lord, I need you to forgive them because I don't know if I can. <laughs> Father, forgive them. And in Luke 23 and 39, so Jesus is hung between two criminal, criminals, two thieves. These are not any ordinary thieves because they are also being executed. He hangs between two thieves, and one of the thieves is mocking Jesus. He's mocking him. He's jeering at Jesus. He's saying, if you are who you say you are, then get yourself down and get us down too. And before Jesus has a chance to respond, the criminal on the other side says, do you fear God? In this moment, we know that he recognizes who Jesus is. Do you fear God? We deserve the punishment, but this man is innocent. And then this, this thief on the cross says, Jesus, remember me when you get to your kingdom. Woo. Remember me. Jesus, remember me. When, when I read that, it reminded me of, of, of my church when we used to sing this song called, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Remember me when you get to your kingdom. And the second thing Jesus says on the cross, he says, surely, he said, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Mm. Somebody ought to get happy about that. He says, today. He says, I assure you, I'm going to give you confidence that today you will be with me in paradise. It shows, here's what it shows. It shows there is nothing so bad that you cannot be delivered from. There's nothing so bad that you cannot be delivered. I know that there's somebody, hold on, don't clap yet, because I know that there's somebody going, yeah, but not me. He doesn't know what I've done. He, he, if he knew how I thought and the things that I've done and the things that I've done in secret, on the cross, Jesus says to a thief who was probably also a murderer, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Mm. This thief recognizes his frailty and he recognizes God's sovereignty. And it only takes a moment. This demonstrates that no matter how bad you've been or how bad it's been, that even when you find yourself at the end of the road and you feel like there's no way out, your last news does not have to be bad news. Because even at your worst, Christ is still offering hope. Christ is still offering hope at your worst. Who would have thought that a criminal would have found hope at an execution? He says, remember me. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. In other words, just when you thought you were at the end, I'm starting a brand new intro. Jesus opens up brand new possibilities. This is not how the story ends. This is where a new chapter begins. He finds hope at a crucifixion. He also finds grace at a crucifixion because this thief is the least likely person to go to paradise. He actually has no good track record that we know of. This is what this lets me know, that good people don't go to heaven. Surrender people go to heaven. I, I know this messes with your religious theology and your stuck up itness. I know, I know it messes with you, but guess what? Good people don't go to heaven. I'm doing all this good stuff, so good people don't go to heaven. Surrendered people go to heaven. Saved people go to heaven. Yeah. Jesus said in Matthew 9, he said, I didn't come for the well. I came for the sick and the hurting. And that's you. And that's me. We are the sick and the hurting. We are the messed up people. Are there any messed up people on our campuses that's willing to go? Yeah, that's me. I'm messed up. 
I messed up. And this is what grace looks like because it grants what you don't deserve. It gives you what you have not earned and it pays for what you cannot afford. And I thank God for grace. Grace does not require you to get yourself together. Grace prepares the way and says, come as you are. It's because of God's grace that God will release you from your past and allow you to walk into a brand new future. And if you're willing to submit and surrender your life. He is willing to accept you just as you are. It's grace that accepts you as you are, but also grace that transforms you into who he's called you to be. Grace. So this thief, this thief finds hope. He finds grace and he finds assurance. Jesus speaks life and assurance. He says, truly, I tell you. He says, I'm confident. He said, you can bet on this, that today you will be with me, which means you will not only have a personal invitation, but I will be your escort. When everybody says you shouldn't be there, you go, no, I'm with, I'm with Jesus. <laughs> Who invited you? I don't see your car. No, I, I can't. You don't have an RSVP? I can't, I can't with Jesus. Who's in your world that's least likely to receive God's grace? Who's in your family that you can be praying for right now? Who's the people that you've given up on? You say, they have no hope. I've done the best that I could do. That God is saying, nope, I need you to show them some grace and, and some hope and, and remind them of the assurance of the gospel. I will not have time to get through all of these. But one of the last things Jesus says is, it is finished. It's finished. That thing that you talked about in Genesis 3 and 15, it's finished. That prophecy that you gave back there, it's finished. This is not a statement of defeat or surrender or abandonment. This is a statement of achievement. It means that he has completed this part of the assignment, which is what he says in John 5, to do the will of my Father. He takes on the suffering, the struggle, and God's wrath because of sin. He paid the debt. He fulfilled the prophecies that spoke of himself to that point. Prophecies were complete. Judgment of sin was complete. Forgiveness of sin was made available. It's been paid for. The account is closed. It is finished. It's finished. It's finished. It's finished. Years ago, I went, I, I invited some friends of mine and some, some high rollers and some ballers to lunch, to dinner. And I told them, it's on me. The, the error that I made is that I let them pick the restaurant. <laughs> I let them pick the restaurant and we get there and, and, and they just balling out. They eating, they drinking, and they're being merry. And then the bill comes. And when I see the bill, I can't pay the bill. I cannot pay it, but I put my hand in my pocket anyway like I could because I said it was on me, but I was nervous. And just as I said it was on me, the waiter, the server came over and said, hey, at the next table, someone who was from our church, hey, they paid the bill. Your bill has already been paid. Woo! This is what Jesus did on the cross. Your sin has already been paid. See, I know you're, you're like me and you think you can figure it out. You keep sticking your hand in your pocket, thinking, oh no, I got this. You keep thinking that you got the addiction and that you have the relationship and that you can manage your sin. And you keep thinking you can do it and you keep thinking you can do it. And God, Jesus is saying, I got this. That's what I went on the cross for. I got this. The Bible tells us that we were crucified with Christ, which means he's not just dying for us. He's also dying with us. Your stuff is on the cross too. And then he finished it. He closed the account. Hey, walk away. The account's closed. The only thing that I left the restaurant was a tip, which was my praise. Because that's all I had anyway. <laughs> that's all you got anyway. You cannot pay for your sins. All you have is your surrender. 
all you have is your praise. All you have is your worship. I wish I could preach more of this, but we about to leave. What I find amazing about all of this is that everything that Jesus says on the cross, he actually says in Psalm 22. Jesus is actually quoting Psalm 22. 90% of what Jesus says on the cross, he says in Psalm 22. Here's, that, here's what this means. What's inside of you when pressure comes is what will come out of you. So what's inside of you? This is, this, this is why that we encourage you to be a part of the things and read your Bible and to pray because everybody is going to go through stuff. Everybody's going to have stuff. Everybody got stuff. But what are you going to do? What's going to come out of you when the stuff shows up? Pastor, this is some heavy stuff, and what am I supposed to do with this? I want you to remember. Remember, reflect, meditate, read this story of what Jesus does on the cross, and pray that God will help you see how serious sin is, how serious sin is, but also the lengths that he's willing to go through to bring you home. Is there anybody here grateful for God's love, grace, and sacrifice? I'm going to hand this over to our campus pastors. I just want to say this. 1 Corinthians 1 and 18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing those who are dying, those who don't get it. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Come on. Yeah. God bless you.